and welcome to another episode of Knowledge Enthusiast Reacts. Uh, this time we will uh, react or analyze um, World War One by Oversimplified Parts One and Two. We do them. Uh, we do them back to back. I might cut in between um, because I'm just a human. And uh, in my in the last video I recorded, I uh, actually yeah. Uh, talked a little much uh, I will try to 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 not talk that much this time uh, especially I will try to uh, concentrate more on on facts on things I actually know but um, yeah as as uh, this this channel is about learning it's it's not without errors so uh, short disclaimer I am not an expert on what I am talking about I am just a knowledge enthusiast, especially for video games and history. I was a history um, student uh, without degree and I um, was a video game journalist. So um, I have some knowledge in, in those regards um, and I have a very, very, very huge broad knowledge. But as things are, when they are huge, um, they can get mixed up so um please if, if i get something wrong hey cat um then uh, please excuse me this channel is about learning together and um yeah uh short uh, info to me i am aussie i am 31 year, 30 year uh, no 31 years old <laughs> i am from uh, east germany but i live in hamburg i was uh, born in east germany but i was raised in hamburg and around hamburg and um yeah like i just said history student former history student and former video game um, journalist and now um i i started this channel to as i said learn with you and react to various videos um this is a video i have already seen multiple times because oversimplified is one of my most favorite um, youtube channels and um, i'm actually supporting them on uh, patreon and uh, yes uh, what else to say uh, let's not talk that much uh, let's just start and uh, let's make a cut here um, so let's start the world of 1914, a time of modern technology, culture, and fashion. Truly the Say height hello. of civilization. Let's have a war. Everyone knew a big war was coming. France wanted some stuff back that Germany had taken from it. Germany wanted to take more of everyone's stuff. Um, that's that's very oversimplified. Um, I I don't I, I don't want to defend anything um, that Germany did in the uh, first and second world war um but it, it's not like germany wanted more of everyone's stuff it's like um germany at this point in time was a very 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 young country it was just um just formed uh, by otto von bismarck and um the um newest powerhouse in europe if you if you want to um, before that um, germany or the holy roman empire or the um uh, northern northern i don't know how it's called in english um uh was just um a loose combination of various uh kingdoms and uh, dukedoms and uh bishop terms thingies um it, it uh, even after napoleon there were still um 39 more or less individual countries within the empire of um the holy roman empire or rheinbund is it called rheinbund um northern Confer Conf north german confederation uh these names are confusing um as i said i'm not an expert um, i'm just an enthusiast and sometimes things like get mixed up and i always liked how the um right part of germany just looks like a, a thumb up just a pure side note um so they were uh, they're um, very very young and they wanted to uh, prove themselves uh, to the rest of the world especially to um, europe especially to the other powers um, that they are a force to be reckoned with 
um, and uh, not dependent on Austria and not dependent on, on former Prussia. Um, they are a state of their own and they are a powerful state. So um, this is why the, in the scramble for Africa, they um, uh, got their colonies and this is why they invested heavily in the new navy and in uh, new, um, in the new, in, in, in making the, the army better and, and stuff like that. And uh, that why they had imperial um, ambitions, um, but it, it, it was not like that Germany at that point uh, thought, yeah, let's just overrun the world um, like they did in uh, the Second World War. It, it, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, what we have to know, um, he will, he will um, come to that, but uh, what we have to know is at this point, uh, Germany and Austria, even though they were part of the holy roman empire before mostly uh, the latter years ruled by austrians by the habsburg monarchies um and they fought uh, uh with each other in various uh, wars um not germany against austria but uh, like prussia against austria in the um, seven years war and in the um, einigungskriege or unification wars um, when uh, Otto von Bismarck um, first uh, conquered parts of uh, Denmark at that point, which was uh, Schleswig and Holstein, which now is Schleswig Holstein, and um, where he um, then uh, uh, fought with um, Austria to be recognized as yeah in independent from Austria, and then they went on uh, to fight um, France to um, get Bavaria and uh, Baden-Württemberg uh, in the Confederation and in the unified Germany. So, um, but even though they had um, a, a history of war with each other, uh, with each other um, they were allies because both of these empires were um, empires of german descent they they belonged somewhat together for a thousand years and um it's just like natural even though the austrian hungarian empire is more than just austria and so more than just um, german-speaking people but you know and it, at that point even italy was on the side of um the central powers as they will be um, called later but they switched side later and they were building a big sexy navy that was making the British uncomfortable. Yeah, that's the navy. These two empires thought they were really cool, but lots of different people who lived there didn't think it was so cool. And some of them had even been declaring independence with help from Russia. Yeah, and that's a thing even today. Um, if you have a multinational um, country or empire, then of course there will be people in it um, that do not want to be in your empire they want to be their own thing um, which in the end is exactly what happened in germany or in italy when uh, with the german unification with the italian unification um, they wanted to be their own thing they wanted to be the country of their um, of their nationalities um, whereas in austria hungarian uh, austria austria hungary um, the um they they had like i said the austrians uh, which were of more or less german descent then they had uh, czechoslovaks they had slavs they had serbs they had um, albanians and so on and so on and so on which are um, very different um, cultural from uh, uh, the the uh, rulers uh, in the end from 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 the austrians um and they wanted to be their own countries like when um like those who were independent in the years before yeah but they didn't think it was so cool and some of them had even been declaring independence with help from russia everyone was talking about each other behind each other's backs throwing the fact that military technology had come a long way since the last major war and suddenly everyone was pretty eager to beat each other up in yeah um before world war one there was a massive um 
arms race. So um, every, like I just said uh, before, um, Germany wanted to to prove itself and um, did somewhat disrupt the the balance of power in in Europe, which um, was previously more or less only um, Great Britain, France, Russia and uh, Austria and Prussia to uh, some degree um, and so on and they they with the unification they they just disrupted that there was a, a, a unified Germany in in the center of Europe um, which was um, developing extremely fast um, by by that uh, by the by the end of the um, 19th uh, century um, and the start of the 20th uh, century Germany was actually the most industrialized country in Europe with uh, even though the British had a head start of around 20 30 years um, which is mostly due to the fact that uh, due to Germany or the Holy Roman Empire being um, spread a, a loose uh, combination of various states, they had various um, centers of, of population. Whereas in, in Great Britain, you have London, you have Manchester, Southampton, uh, Edinburgh and so on. You have some big cities, but um, which are more or less important, but in Germany, every every single of these um, smaller states within uh, the borders had their own capital, had their own um, center of of production, and suddenly, when they were unified, they had um, various developed um, cities like Hamburg, Berlin, Essen, Düsseldorf, Dortmund, uh, Köln. Uh, Munich, uh, Dresden, uh, Danzig, Königsberg, etc. Uh, like all over the the empire, there were um, industrialized um, cities, and now there were one single state which could share all the information um, they had, all the industrial uh, industrialization uh, secrets, if you will, um, they had, and and just steamrolled uh, more or less over um, the other countries what, what, what's going on here uh, okay not not in the sense of what I, that that's a very wrong use of, of the word but you know what I mean they they just um, overtook Great Britain they overtook everyone and um, that's one of the reasons why the arms race started because the other ones felt threatened by by such uh, strong Germany and uh, they they didn't want to miss um, miss out and and then they um, uh, invested um, themselves more heavily in, in arms and um, also there was the situation that the situation in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, was um, hot for a very, very long time. Even Otto von Bismarck, 20 years um, and a few months before um, the uh, First World War started, said that um, there will be a great war. And um, he don't know when, he don't know um, uh, who will fought in it and who will win. Um, but what he knew was um, that it will be started by some damn thing in the Balkans. My God, I'm 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 already talking too much. Long way since the last major war, and suddenly everyone was pretty eager to beat each other up. In this area of Austria-Hungary lived some Serbs and Bosnians who hated living in Austria-Hungary. So the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand goes there for a nice drive in an open-top car with his car's route published in advance. Yeah, fun fact about Franz Ferdinand um, of Austria, I might make this a little bit louder. Um, Franz Joseph um, the first, the emperor of, of Austria-Hungary, actually was did not like him. Um, Franz Ferdinand was the, the heir of the throne, but uh, Franz Joseph did not like him. And um, when I was in uh, Vienna two years ago, I visited some museums and I were, um, there I was told, 
Sorry, uh, my cat just marked behind me and I had to clean it up. So, um, yeah, uh, Franz, uh, Franz Joseph did not like Franz Ferdinand. And when Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, um, as I was told in Vienna, um, Franz uh, uh, Joseph just like shrunk. He, 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 he didn't care. Um, sure, it was it was sad uh, from from a human perspective. But um, from from his perspective, it was just, just yeah okay. Now we need a new heir. Um, he did not. Uh, so he, he, his advisors came to him and said, "We we can't let this happen. We we can just sit here and say, hmm, okay, they murdered our uh, crown prince. So we need a new one. Um, we need to go to war." And Franz Joseph was strongly against it um he was he had to be convinced by his uh, council that they have to go to war with um the with serbia um in the end um but like just like i said uh, franz joseph did not care at all so let's uh, go on and remember spacebar means end recording <laughs> Ferdinand goes there for a nice drive in an open-top car with his car's route published in advance. And that went just about as well as you'd expect. Some assassins were waiting for him along the way and threw bombs at his car, but they missed and blew up some officers behind him instead. So the Archduke goes into hiding, leaves Sarajevo, and the whole war never happens. Except no, the Archduke doesn't leave, but instead goes back out in the open-top. He, he, he wanted to uh, visit the um soldier who was um wounded and uh his driver took a wrong turn um this is this is just hypothetical and it's just me talking bullshit here but i always thought what if just what if the driver was into it and did not make a wrong turn on on uh, on accident but on purpose just just so um, he could be murdered. But of course I could be wrong, Allah. Uh, but pff, I don't know. Top car to visit the injured officers in hospital. The driver takes a wrong turn and by sheer coincidence gets stuck beside one of the failed assassins. I mean, it is actually sheer coincidence. You, He took a wrong turn and then stopped right in front of an assassin. Hmm. I mean, it, it can be pure coincidence, but um, I always thought this is this is too convenient somehow. But yeah, the driver takes a wrong turn and by sheer coincidence gets stuck beside one of the failed assassins who shoots him. Austria Hungary is understandably pissed about all this. And they as I said, not Austria Hungary is pissed. The uh, ministers are the, the emperor is just like. I don't care. They think the Serbian government had something to do with it, which they might have. So they go to their ally Germany and say, hey Germany, we're going to declare war in Serbia. And Germany is all for that. So Austria-Hungary send a big list of impossible demands to Serbia, and when Serbia refuses, they declare war. Yeah, um, this is the, uh, uh, as we call it, Blanco, um, how do we call it? Um like a blanco check uh someone like this um it was just like germany told austria hungary that if you go to war we will back you up because we're allies um and stuff it was not like um go for it do it uh, or, or, or stuff like that it was just like we will back you up and um secretly they might have um their plans uh, like we know they had the schlieffen plan and um i actually have seen a series by um extra credits um about the uh outbreak of the first world war world war world war um where they explain that actually it could all have been prevented um because in these few days few hours um before the war actually started um the diplomats of all involved countries especially germany and um russia were like yeah on on 
Uh, yeah, arguing, not not arguing. Um, on, uh, 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 I I don't know the the word right now, but um, the the diplomats um were were um trying to prevent um the war and um the officials were trying um somehow to prevent the war but it broke out uh, nevertheless and um not without some uh kind of aggression from um austria and uh, germany um yeah the big list of impossible demands to serbia and when serbia refuses they declare war and it's actually um you have to know serbia did not refuse the whole depeche um, they got they uh there were some very very stupid demands uh from today's perspective um on that list but um uh serbia did agree to all of them but one which was enough for austria-hungary austria-hungary to declare war austria-hungary and germany are friends and serbia is protected by russia who's friends with france so they'll declare war on each other montenegro joins in too france and britain also have a kind of alliance so when france says hey britain you got my back britain is like maybe and then they decide to stay out of it, which is great for Germany, because Germany has a plan. They know that Russia is so big and clumsy that it will take them a while to get ready for war. Yeah, Germany actually took um, a lot of um, gambles in the First World War. The first one was to assume that um, Russia would be too slow to, to mobilize. As we know today, which kind of... The war guilt in the end of World War One was put on Germany, even though Germany wasn't the first nation to declare war. Um, it was also Hungary declaring it on uh, Serbia, and uh, they even weren't the first to mobilize their troops. Um, because today, um, if if I remember correctly, today it is thought that Russia did actually uh, mobilize their troops even before the whole thing started which is why they were ready so soon um i don't know if they started before even the assassination but um they they were um are now considered to be the first to have uh, actually been uh, mobilizing their troops in uh, world war one so with this guy in charge germany will send all its troops into france at lightning speed while russia's getting ready Defeat France, then move all the troops to Russia and defeat Russia, and then we all speak German and eat Pfeffer Potast every day. Just one problem. France has loads of forts and defenses along its German border, and Germany can't waste any time fighting them. Yeah, this is um, later known as the Maginot Line. Um, I don't know if that if it was called that um, in that time. I don't think so. I think the Maginot Line was actually um, uh, reinforced... Um, uh, line of defense um, which was a predecessor um, of the this defense line now and uh, yeah germany now has, has 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 the problem where do we do we attack um when the einigungskriege the the unification wars were with um france germany captured the king they captured paris they um, defeated france hard and um they could do so because they could march in the country and um could do this uh, from their own border they don't had to 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 pass through um, belgium um uh, and th this is one of the reasons why france uh, did uh, reinforce the border with germany so germany has now the problem if we go there they will um may might be able to to um withstand our attacks so we have to go around um which they do um, via belgium which they will repeat in world war ii to most success um and uh which is the second gamble they take because um they thought if they go through belgium who is protected by great britain that great britain would not interfere 
which is a stupid gamble, um, but a gamble nonetheless they made. So Germany decides to go around them through Belgium. Belgium is neutral, but Germany wants to march 750,000 troops through it to get around France's defenses. They're hoping Belgium will just kind of sit down and shut up, but they don't. They fight back, and they're pretty good too, so they slow the Germans down. What's worse is that Britain shows up, and they're pretty pissed that Germany is invading neutral countries. So now Britain declares war in Germany. So Germany push on through Belgium and commit some atrocities along the way. They also wear spikes and sometimes skulls on their uniform. Um, at this point, I have to say that uh, World War I um, is hugely overshadowed by um, World War II. Not only in the international recognition, but um, in, in German recognition as well. Um, we actually do not teach that much of uh, World War I and we don't learn that much of World War I um, because um, World War II has a um, way bigger um, yeah way bigger impact on on the german society and uh, the way the germans uh, teach history um so world war one is usually um, at least when i went to school um it was more or less glimpsed over we, we just talked about it happened and uh we did not talk about specific battles especially um, except the the most famous ones like um Verdun and um, the other one, uh, I forgot the name right now. Um, we we talk shortly about um, uh, Lenin and how he was smuggled back to to Russia by the Germans to um, get Russia out of the war, and uh, of course uh, toxics and um, the the trench uh, fights, but that's mostly it it's it's just to set up the stage for world war ii so to speak um what we learn about world war one and um which which in my opinion is, is really sad because world war one is a very interesting um war with with a lot that happened there with a lot that lost the lives it's the uh, only the 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 second time that the world has seen such a um global conflict after the seven years war um but this time even bigger you could even say napoleonic wars and and coalition wars were somewhat of some kind of of world war ii uh but uh, uh i think i'm the only one um uh going in that direction but um world war one was devastating and it was a huge war and it's sad that we don't learn uh, that much about it um on the other hand we have an oversaturation on, on world war ii if you if you turn on the tv and to uh, any history channel any documentation uh, documentation you see it's usually about world war ii and um which we have a very 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 specific more specific knowledge um when it comes to to um, the crazy stuff that happened in it, not the battles uh, again, and and uh, but more like Hitler and stuff, and yeah. Belgium and commit some atrocities along the way. The so so what, what my point was, um, we di we didn't even learn um, about those atrocities. When I watched this video the first time, it was the first time I heard of those um, atrocities in in Belgium. They also wear spikes and sometimes skulls on their uniform. So if you're trying to not look like the bad guys, good job. The Allies have a propaganda extravaganza. And this don't ask me influence around about the, the scars. I don't know. America. The U.S. President it's Woodrow dumb. Wilson sees himself as a bit of a Jesus figure and spends most of the war trying to get everyone to just hug it out. But there's also a large population of ethnic Germans living in the United States, and when the war first broke out, they were like, yay, Germany. But now that they're committing atrocities in Belgium, they're less enthusiastic. Even today, there are still um, over one or two million um, people in America who um, actually speak German. Um, 
with uh, Texas German, Louisiana um, German and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and the uh, Amish, um, as far as I know, uh, do also speak some dialect of, of German, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and they wear a lot more. It was even, um, if uh, I was told, um, uh, and, and I think I saw a, a documentation once, um, that uh, there, were, there were discussion if German um, should be an officially recognized language in uh, the US, like English and Spanish. Um, uh, so um, because they had such a huge percentage of, of people who actually spoke German um, and uh, so if, if that would have went through, then um, not only in, in some states like today, you would have in, in all the US um, everything written in uh, English, Spanish and uh, German. And um, I was also told that at one point it was considered uh, when there was the question which language should be um, the, the universal language to communicate all over the world, like it English is it, 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 it is English today, but at some point Germany German was um, kind of in there as well, um, which was at a point where German was more widely spoken than um, today, in terms of percentage, not in terms of actual speakers today. It's like 120 million, and I don't think that this number was that high. At that point, but with uh, World War One and especially World War Two, um, as is, you have you you are in the in the states and uh, you are of German descent. You speak German, and suddenly war breaks out, and you are the bad guys. And uh, then the second World War breaks out, and you are the even better guys. And that's uh, one of the main reasons why um, German uh, is not that. Uh, common these days in, in anymore in, in the US. Let's play Spot the French Soldier. Did you see him? Easy, right? He's wearing a bright blue uniform with red trousers. And do you know who else spotted him easily too? The Germans. So when the French were slowly marching in columns through the countryside, the Germans easily tore them to shreds with their giant guns. All the nations involved in this war went in with an old school war mentality. <laughs> And all of them had to update their uniforms and tactics a lot during the Great War. No boots. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm actually wondering if Serb, Serbian um, soldiers, what, what does no boots exactly mean? That they just have shoes, sandals or something like that? And um, yeah, no helmet. No helmet actually were a big problem for most of the um entente um troops um because uh, this was the first time they actually really needed uh stuff like that because um of the sheer amount of bullets that were shot and their um devastating uh, impact uh, possibilities you know what i mean um the germans came out with with helmets um because they always had helmets the the prussian army had helmets and it was just a thing but it became something that was actually really really good and practical in the war and um, at first the u.s soldiers and the brits um, did also not have helmets for everyone and um, I, I remember i have seen a documentation where they actually explained that um, a huge amount of helmets were more or less uh, crafted during the war um, by the soldiers themselves um, to, to have some kind of protection, like uh, take a metal plate and, and form it uh, to a helmet so they had anything on their head, but it was not comfor uh, comfortable. And um, yeah, but... I'm not 100% sure about that. As I said, I'm not a historian. I am not a history teacher or something. I'm just um, learning things as you do. And um, sometimes I misremember things, so please don't judge me. And all of them had to update their uniforms and tactics a lot during the Great War. 
because this war was going to be like nothing anyone had ever seen before. Russia's ready for war, and way earlier than expected. Hey, Austria-Hungary, can you get on top of that? Oh yeah, sure, we've got this. Nope. Yeah, a huge problem for Germany, and I, I won't defend any atrocities and, and any um, ambitions, uh, especially not in Second World War, but uh, it seems like Germany always makes the wrong friends. Um, I never understood why why Germany wasn't allied with Russia and uh, Great Britain because Great Britain was ruled by Germans. Um, uh, King George the Fourth, I guess, was um, if I remember correctly the first one even of that um, house that um, did not uh, was not wasn't born in uh, Germany. It uh, was the House of Brunswick. Uh, or Braunschweig, uh, as we say in Germany, um, Hannover, Braunschweig, uh, somewhere like that. And um, they were the kings of uh, the uh, the whole British Empire and they were German. And uh, I think George IV, some George was the first one actually born in uh, Great Britain and uh, raised English speaking. Uh, some of those before did not even speak English. And uh, Victoria was of German descent, and even Elizabeth II today is still of the same house, even though they renamed after the wars. Um, she is of uh, German descent. And um, at that point, um, King. Uh, who was king at that point? I don't know. Was um, actually still of German descent and still uh, a cousin of the German emperor and of the Russian Tsar, which also was of German descent, like um, because uh, Peter the third, I guess, and uh, Catherine the Great were both Germans, were both from Prussia and um, installed as, as a Tsar and then female Tsar, I don't know how you say that in English, Empress. Um, uh, and but still of German descent and and uh, Nikolai was it Nikolai at uh, in the in the First World War was um, still of that German family so still um, related to the German emperor still related to the British emperor and um, instead Germany goes with Austria which sucks at fighting as we see here um, and later with in Second World War with Italy who also suck at fighting who didn't even were able to to get to Greece without heavy casualties. Hey Austria-Hungary, can you get on top of that? Oh yeah, sure, we've got this. Nope. So Germany has to send some troops back to the east to defend against the Russians. The chief of staff of the Austro-Hungarian army is this guy, and although he is handsome, he turns out not to be the best military strategist. Austria-Hungary constantly ignores Germany's advice and then comes running back to Germany whenever they get in trouble. We have here um, two very different um, ideologies. Germany might be a unified country at that point, but it's still of Prussian descent and the leaders still are Prussians. And as we all know, the famous quote, as um, other states have an army, the Prussian army has a state. Um, this mentality was still um, very, very huge in uh, Germany, and um, so they they they've seen themselves as some kind of um, strategy masterminds, and to some degree they actually were, um, with uh, a lot more training, um, uh, a lot better um, process of getting officers and, and such um, which were not of royalty or something but they actually had um, official officer schools and, and stuff like that and um, then you have Austria-Hungary who just do what they want who um, have even problems to, to raise an army on their own with soldiers who actually want to fight for Austria-Hungary because as we know um, learned in the beginning uh, the half of the of the kingdom wanted to to uh, be independent and um, they 
don't even wa uh, would you um, please say in the comment would you fight for a country that you don't want to be a part of I wouldn't Austria-Hungary even gets its ass kicked by tiny Serbia, who repels all their invasion attempts at the start of the war. It's better news for Germany in the north, though, where they almost completely wipe out the Russian second army. Back on the western front, the Germans continue advancing and are in sight of Paris. At this point, anyone would be forgiven for thinking the Germans were going to get that quick victory after all. But then things start to go wrong. The French commander-in-chief knew something had to be done, and he ordered his armies to stop retreating. In the resulting battle, a gap opened up in the German lines. If a gap opens up, the enemy can use it to flank you from the side and behind, so the German armies have to retreat. The Allies launch a counterattack, so the Germans dig into defensive positions. The Allies do the same. Then both... It's, it's not that easy, though. Um, you, you, you can't just imagine uh, they... they uh, went a few meters back and then took out their shovels and and digged in no um the first thing you have to do is actually set up defensive positions so um while you're digging those um trenches you don't want to be shot um and uh so they they gradually um yeah gr grew um so to speak um to become the trenches that uh, we know today um with all these complex systems with um second and third trenches with uh rotating um uh, troops in there and and stuff like that uh, and the the no man's land in between um but uh, at first uh, th that process did not it was not overnight like the 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 berlin wall was not built overnight even though it sometimes it's stated that it was it was at, at some barbed wire at first and then you know the germans dig into defensive positions the allies do the same then both sides move north trying to outflank each other along the way when they reach the sea, they're in a stalemate with trench systems running the whole way from the coast to Switzerland. The beginning of trench warfare on the Western Front. Here's how trench warfare works. Two opposing lines of trenches with no man's land in between. One side would pummel the other with hundreds of thousands of artillery shells. Yeah, um, this was um, also the, the first war where artillery was used in in that fashion you had artillery in in previous wars you had like those rolling cannons and later on you had um like a bit more advanced artillery um like you've seen in in the american civil war but at this point you had machine guns and you had like stationary cannons who um, were able to shoot um, a lot of shells over the day and um, they didn't even care if they hit or missed. It, it's just to to um, yeah shake them more or less. Um, that's that's why um, shell shock um, was was such a thing in, in the First World War. Um, even though they they did not uh, get any injuries by um, a shell itself, the the sheer. Um, just imagine you you're sitting in in these trenches and uh, all around you things are exploding it's loud it's shaking this uh no one could be be untouched by this um why i paused here because um i wanted shortly to uh, you might already know that but um these uh, trenches as you see are not in a straight line why are they not in a straight line um because let's say this uh blue guy here would run over no man's land and actually make it uh, past this machine gun into the um, trench then he could just stay stand here and shoot in that direction and that direction and everyone's dead if it was a straight line so um, this is more or less a defense uh, mechanism to prevent uh, such a thing from happening so you can uh, take cover even if someone is in your trench but as I said you already knew that <laughs> with no man's land in between. One side would pummel the other with hundreds of thousands of artillery shells, sometimes for days at a time. This had a huge psychological effect on the soldiers, leaving many shell shocked. Then the attacking troops would leave their trenches and rush across no man's land. Which was shockingly um, 
from, from not even from today's perspective but also the the perspective of the people uh, at that time it was they it was a shock to everyone i guess they actually did it um it's it's you have to imagine just to to you are in your safe little space and now someone tells you now just kill yourself basically um and if you don't get killed you might be able to to um gain some um some losses on their side but uh it's more or less a suicide commando to 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 go there um which is one of the reasons why the um, casualties especially on on the uh, on taunt side are so high in the first um, world war um, because they just send wave after wave after wave and the uh, british commando uh, especially the british commando did order them to do so and many of them didn't want to um uh you, what I can uh, suggest on, on that regard is um, it's not historically um, accurate or something but uh, Blackadder goes forth the fourth season of Blackadder with uh, Rowan Atkinson alias Mr. Bean um, depicts trench life in a humor humoristic way but in a you you get a grasp of what um, the soldiers actually feels like feel like because Blackadder himself the only thing he wants is to get out of there uh, and not the way depicting here in in the picture now but the other way back home push up then the attacking troops would leave their trenches and rush across no man's land a muddy wet mass of shell craters and barbed wire the defending trench would unleash machine gun fire on the attackers inflicting thousands of casualties the attackers would send wave after wave until either they gave up or the opposing trench was finally overrun there would be months of fighting and the deaths of thousands in order to gain a few meters or kilometers of land. Living in the trenches was hard work too. Corpses, mud that could swallow you whole, pools of poisonous water, rats, disease, the smell. It's insane that millions of soldiers put up with these conditions and commanders ordered them to do so. Yeah, like I just said, they were ordered to do so and they they complied. Um, which you... Um, we, we will um I, I don't remember if he talks about that but um one of the reasons why germany um actually agrees to the armistice is that the um not the soldiers um, put on the mutiny but the sailors in kiel on the home uh, they, they're still home and uh, the emperor wants to send them to to attack britain um, and then there is a mutiny of those um, of those um, uh, sailors in Kiel, and um, but but no uh, no huge recorded or impactful mutiny um, along those um, along those soldiers on the front lines itself in those trenches. Yes, there are um, uh, records of of those um who who fled or um i always for, forget the the english word uh it's it's not a mutiny mutiny is is uh, is only on the ship i guess um on on field it's uh you know they went missing they they just ran away let's just say that um i guess i will come up with the word later um but yeah the, the, but not in those uh, not not as, as a unit um and not in those huge numbers as they did in kill then um which is for me at least it's it's very shocking um because i uh, even if 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 uh, my country depends on it if my life depends on it under this conditions um with so little hope especially in in the later years um i'm not sure if i would comply those orders when when someone tells me okay and now you go over the trench and if you don't get shut down you're lucky <laughs> for years i guess i could uh, yeah uh, this uh, was part one um i will take a short break uh, break <laughs> Um, and we continue with part two directly. Uh, welcome back. In case you forgot, 
we are still on oversimplified world war one this is part two and let's start with both sides stuck in a hard stalemate they knew this war wasn't going to be about taking territory but about simply wearing each other down yeah um it is one of the the most devastating wars in history and especially it's the first one of that scale and um even though nothing happened at all and like in in world war ii you have those huge land gains uh within a few years within a few months even uh sometimes within a few weeks and uh because of the blitzkrieg because of um um the the mentality not to repeat um the first world war um and at this point which is still pretty early in the war um the the only goal everyone um approaches is just wearing each other down just hope they would break before we do um but i guess it's not that early in the war because i think they will now come to lenin and um the, the russian opt-out was which was in 1917 if i remember correctly which was the uh, second to last year they knew this war wasn't going to be about taking territory but about simply wearing each other down the allies had plenty of men to expend from its overseas dominions look at that that's um mostly the uh british empire look at how huge it is and you see you see um this is this is german togoland this is um uh no this is german east africa this is german west africa this is today's cameroon i think which was german as well i think these some kind of uh, small uh, small thingies are um the german uh, colonies um and uh interesting is in one of those colonies which i think it was um german uh, east africa um there was a general in the first world war paul uh paul von leto forbeck yes uh, i just looked at uh, a tab i had actually opened about him um who never lost a fight in the war and um, defended um, his part of um, Africa from any invasions, which was pretty uh, quote unquote easy because it's a thick jungle, it's rough terrain, um, it's some kind of guerrilla tactics they uh, used. Um, you can compare that to the um, tactics used in Vietnam later in, in the 20th uh, century. And um, he actually fought until, I guess, three or four days after the armistice took place, when he was informed uh, that the armistice took place. Um, he was captured, um, captive for a few months and then sent back home. Um, because at this point, the um entente uh especially the british did not have that bad of an opinion of the germans like they would have after world war ii and the russians also uh, did not have that um and it's it's ob obviously it's not only the british empire like um some parts here are french too like algeria and morocco uh Mor it was morocco french i'm not sure but it was part of the entente nevertheless do the to, do to be a colony of one of the members um, yeah and uh, germany actually had uh, also a few tiny parts here in uh, asia like uh, bismarck archipel here uh, and uh, some small islands which uh, japan uh, japan wanted to have and um, even a, a small um a small colony on uh, China uh, Chinese um, soil which actually helped the Japanese later to invade China when they uh, took it from the Germans like they took all the other islands um, so yeah that's that wearing each other down the Allies had plenty of men to expend from its overseas dominions and the British also started a naval blockade so Germany couldn't import stuff 
like food. Neither side really wanted a long, grueling war though, so they both thought of ways to break the deadlock on the Western Front. Idea number one, new frontiers. When the war first broke out, Australia was quick to take German New yep. Guinea. The Allies also quickly jumped on Germany's colonies in Africa, and particularly in German East Africa, locals were enlisted as soldiers and carriers by both sides, leading to a tragic loss of life for the native Africans. Some new combatants entered the war. But, but that the picture was, was not correct. Uh, German East Africa was not invaded. As far as I know, it, it was held until uh, three days after the armistice, four days after the armistice, uh, by by uh, Paul von. Uh, uh, I already forgot the name again. Paul von Leto Vorbeck. My, oh my. Um, uh, yeah, they uh, captured the British uh, uh, biker um, who had the um, the the uh, a note of the armistice in his bag, and uh, that's how they um, were informed about the armistice, which they at first did not believe. But yeah, um, yeah, he was undefeated as far as I know. Or as well. The Allies' new friends were Italy and Japan. Japan was busy building itself an empire, so it was more than happy to yeah. take away German But Italy switched sides during the Italy war. actually had an alliance with Germany yeah. and Austria Hungary before the war. But after some tense relations, and then the Allies promising to give them some of Austria Hungary's stuff, they switched sides. Italy opened up a front in the mountains here, but like everyone else, they were stuck in stalemate for most of the war. The Central Powers' new friend was a. And. You have to see um, that's the Alps and um, which is the um, highest mountain chain in um, continental Europe, um, second only to the um, Russian uh, mountain like the like Ural and, and all the stuff which is partly Asia. So it's always um, yeah, it's 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 uh, always. Um, not clear like if you if you want to know which is the highest mountain of europe you either say uh, mont blanc i think it is with something something over four thousand uh, meters or it is the albrus which is in russia or georgia or something like that which is or is not in asia so um it varies and uh but you have in the Alps, um, it was it was trench warfare as well, but in mountains. And uh, that means you have um, at a lot of points um, a huge advantage as defender if you are on the higher position, which um, Austria-Hungary was um, in most cases. Um, so if you want to storm that, you, you just you, there's no no man's land between which is uh, flat land more or less uh, muddy flat land, um, but flat land nonetheless. Um, you have to climb a mountain and just have you yourself being gunned down more or less, um, which um, is the reason why there was no real gain um, in the Alps during the war. As far as they were stuck in stalemate for most of the war. The Central Powers new friend was a struggling empire in the Middle East. The Ottomans Ottoman? The Ottoman were divided on whether to actually join the war or not, since they had been exhausted by the recent Balkan Wars. Some of the politicians who did want to join went off on their own and fired some shells at Russia, and then came back and said, whoops, looks like we're at war now. The Ottoman entry into the war was of particular concern to the British, since the Middle East was full of oil, and Britain wanted all of that oil. First, the Ottomans tried to attack Russia in the Caucasus Mountains. But they weren't prepared for the cold, and many of them froze to death. Then they crossed miles of desert Never to take in the Suez Canal Russia from the British, but that failed too. Then the Allies tried to take the Dardanelles at Gallipoli in a long and hard trench warfare campaign, but that also failed. Yeah, um, and Gallipoli especially. Um, Winston Churchill will later be Prime Minister of um, Great Britain in the Second World War. But at this point, he was a general admiral, some kind of that from the um, British army. And he was responsible for um, the invasion in Gallipoli. 
um, which turned out to be just throwing his man at the Ottoman uh, defenders. And imagine D-Day, but in World War One, with a victory for the, in the, this case, the Ottomans. Uh, they just they were just gunned down and. Um, in another epic rap battles of history, um, Winston Churchill against Freddie, um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, not Freddie. Um, there is this line, uh, you tossed lives, uh, you tossed away lives in Gallipoli like they were tossed off your plate. And that's what it was. Um, they did not make um, a, a, a good landing there and uh, yeah were not able to to secure the um, Black Sea. Um, the reason why they wanted to to land in Gallipoli is because you see here this uh, this small strait, and in reality here is a small strait as well because here is Istanbul. Um, this is the Black Sea, and the Black Sea is the only uh, year-round uh, warm water port for the Russians. So naturally, almost the whole Russian um, naval uh, forces are here because in the um, East uh, Baltic Sea, as, as you, we, we say Ostsee, like Eastern Sea, but it's Baltic Sea, um, they have some access, but um, it freezes in winter and stuff. That's, that's why the Crimean Wars um, were a thing, that's why many other wars where i think that's why um even today or one of the reasons why even today russia wants to have crimea and s stuff like that uh, because they want these access to um that warm water ports in uh, the black sea and controlling this two straits here um, means that you control the entire uh, entirety of the black sea um, access to the uh, mediterranean which in fact is now uh, also the now is uh, it was ever um also access to to all the um other trade routes in the uh, atlantic um so the british wanted to join forces with the russians and uh, make it easier to for troops to um be exchanged to to coordinate because um even they even though they were allies the russians and france and russia uh, and britain they they did not share any borders or something they they had no way to to actually work together um except they would be able to um make this landing in gallipoli and secure these straits uh, so that's what they tried there and that's what they failed miserably um, but as he will say now um, they were more successful in the southern parts of the Ottoman Empire which uh, funny enough was uh, for the most time a huge enemy of Austria-Hungary and now their allies to take the Dardanelles at Gallipoli in a long and hard trench warfare campaign but that also failed the Ottomans blamed their initial losses on the ethnic Armenians living within Ottoman territory, and the resulting Armenian genocide led to the deaths of one and a half million people. And even today is reason for high tensions, uh, especially between Germany and Turkey, um, because a few years ago Germany officially declared um, those um, murderings as a genocide. Um, while Turkey is not happy about that. They've, in their eyes, it's it was um, justified and it was not a genocide and it was not systematic. And um, what is Germany even thinking? Because we have our own genocide on hand with uh, the Holocaust, which we accept and do not deny. It is a crime to deny the Holocaust in Germany. And um, so, yeah... Um, but it was in fact a genocide. There were a lot of Armenians killed just for be, being Armenians, sadly. Territory, and the resulting Armenian genocide led to the deaths of one and a half million people. Then the Germans sent spies into Afghanistan to try to convince the Arab tribes there to rise up in jihad against the British and attack India. But that plan failed, partly because the spies got bored, brewed their own alcohol, and got drunk. Um, 
Sorry, my, my cats are doing stuff here. Um, in fact, it just mentioned um, on, on this, as a side note here um, that they that German spies went to Afghanistan and tried to um, to 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 um, get them to do a jihad, which is the holy war um, in in uh, in the mass Islamic. Um, religion of some kind of um anyway this is not the first and it won't be the last time that a western uh, power comes into an islamic country and tries to convince them to declare a jihad on someone else um it will happen again and some uh, people think today that um all these um terror and uh, even 9-11 and stuff is more or less homemade because uh, when the Americans got to um, Saudi Arabia or to to Iraq or to all those parts and tried to um, well, during the Cold War um, try to convince them to declare jihad on the communists um, they laid the uh, founding of uh, modern terrorism and Jihad, uh. which is a bad thing to do in Afghanistan. All these new frontiers hadn't done much to change the war. Aware that the Allies had more men and supplies than them, the Germans knew they had to do something to break the stalemate. Before the war, there was a big conference that set out the rules of modern warfare. No chemical weapons, no killing civilians. Basically, don't be jerks. The Germans held a meeting and decided to be jerks. Z yeah, um... I, I won't defend this. Um, the Germans were the first one to use chemical weapons, um, even though it had to be said, it has to be said that the um, the the uh, British and um, the uh, French also quickly thereafter used chemical weapons. So, which also have to mean that they were in development. Um, it might have just been a matter of time like with uh, with the Ru russian mobilization as we said on the beginning of the video um but uh you have from germany's uh, perspective you are in these in these stalemates um you are um more or less undefeated for a few years now um especially the, uh, the prussians and um this is a situation you just don't know and um like in in every situation in life in every situation in history when you find yourself cornered when you find yourself surrounded and you know you have to do th something to, to to just break break out um and this was the idea they they came they went with um because one of the thought process behind it was just to uh the 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 horror uh, horror it would unleash on the um on town would just force them to um first um retreat and secondly um eventually give up and um but at least it would uh provide some some room of breathing um for the germans to um get sorted to to um reorganize to reinforce and maybe to even push them back um to to make sure that there is still a chance to win um you can can imagine like imagine yourself being um restrained in some th some kind and just doing this and and breaking out of your restraints um this is what the germans wanted to do um similar but on 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 three over three corners thought it is uh, similar to what the americans did in world war ii with uh, japan when they dropped the atomic bombs um which was a show of force um and which was or is still believed um to have saved hundreds of thousands of lives because um st still some people believe that this was the reason why um, Japan um, in the end uh, surrendered to the US which in fact they didn't 
not because of that it was one reason but uh, also russia declared war and they were at a lost position um, they knew the invasion would come and uh, they knew also that they wouldn't um, survive and uh, they almost had no resources left but that's a story for another time um, so but still um, one of the reasons the US did it was to force um, Japan to surrender to, uh, to to give them the last push if you say so and this is some kind of what uh, the Germans also thought um, with the chemical weapons not that it would give the uh, Entente the, the final push to, to surrender but at least to give them some, some breathing room and, and spare them um, uh, yeah, spare them uh, maybe a few weeks or months of, of trench warfare if the uh, war starts to move again with uh, when the um, Entente retreats but yeah as you, we all know it was a gamble and this gamble did also not work basically don't be jerks the Germans held a meeting and decided to be jerks Zeppelin air raids commenced over British cities they also started attacking the Allied trenches with chlorine gas and they used submarines to sink civilian ships one such civilian ship was the Lusitania which had 159 Americans on board when it was sunk further swaying U.S. opinion against the Germans. Not to be completely unfair to the Germans, the Allies also engaged in chemical warfare soon after, and they had been hiding anti-submarine weapons on their civilian ships, which let the Germans justify their attacks. Yeah. Um, it is highly debated today, uh, and even at that uh, time, if there was some justification for the Germans um, sinking ships. Um, but they're they're in a war and it was some kind of total war and um, they as we as we as, as they said um, before the main goal at the um, goal at that point was to wear the enemy down to um, force them to give up however you do it and um, one way the Germans uh, thought would be um, helping is if they cut um, Britain's supply lines especially on weapons um, and yes they sunk um, ships with Americans on board they sunk other ships um, but the Americans at that point were um, as it is believed today and I think it's also confirmed uh, to a degree uh, they were hiding weapons and and stuff on that ship and on the other ships um, not only the, the Lusitania um, so if you don't sink the ship then your enemy will get not, not necessarily stronger but um, it will take more time to um, defeat them if they get uh, supplies um, if you sink the ship you took you take a gamble again and and just hope that you can justify it um, in the aftermath but um, like I always say when when I make a team kill in Rainbow Six Siege I when I someone is behind me I hear him I turn around and I shoot I don't ask questions uh, before I shoot I ask questions later because if it's an enemy they will shoot first and well anyway um, that was a bit off topic now <laughs> had been hiding anti-submarine weapons on their civilian ships which let the Germans justify their attacks meanwhile Austria-Hungary still hadn't dealt with Serbia so the Central Powers enlisted some help Bulgaria wished it was bigger and was still bitter about losing the Second Balkan War the Central Powers promised to make all of Bulgaria's wildest dreams come true if they helped, so they signed on, and together they knocked out Serbia. The Serbian troops retreated through Albania, which... It's, um, if you remember from the first video, um, the whole point of the war, seemingly in the, in the beginning, was Serbia, because a Serb backed it's it's still debated um but um in sarajevo the crown prince was shot serbia might have um involvements in that 
and that's why Austria declared war on Serbia and that's why all the other wars break out because of um, ally, um, ally systems and only now which is I think 1916 starting 1917 um, I actually don't know because as I said we don't learn such things in, in school by um, uh, in, in Germany um, Serbia is actually conquered so they took their time so they signed on and together they knocked out Serbia the Serbian troops retreated through Albania, which was neutral but had some ties to Austria-Hungary. So Austria-Hungary entered Albania in a friendly invasion to chase down the Serbians, many of whom escaped by sea. It's 1916, and a yeah, lot is 1916. happening. As if they didn't have... So it took them two years to accomplish the original goal of the war, at least what they declared war on. Um, and now they're still going. At this point uh, in time, uh, please let me know in the comments what you think about it. Um, would you think that when they sued for uh, peace now or for an armistice now, um, what effect that would have happened? Because main goal is reached, um, Serbia is conquered, um, everyone got what they wanted more or less uh, except from Serbia and Russia maybe because Russia wanted to protect Serbia um, but now you, you are in those um, stalemates and now you could say okay uh, we fight over it we uh, we reached a goal now let's stop this war and uh, be friends again I don't know if that would be, have been a possibility and if that um, would have led to maybe a second world war never happening i don't know i'm just talking out of my ass here and i'm talking bullshit now uh so let's continue with the video just just forget what i just said i see it's 1916 and a lot is happening as if they didn't have enough enemies already germany added one more to the list portugal had been getting a bit chummy with the allies behind the scenes and germany didn't like that one bit Around the same time, the only sea battle of the war happened. Both sides had a new powerful class of battleships he called Dreadnoughts, but they were so expensive to build that neither side wanted to risk losing them in a battle. So they kept them in port, except for one time when they had a big fight and a bunch of them got dead. Why did I say behemoths? I, I know it's Dreadnoughts. Um, why? Do, what was behemoths? Sorry, I just have to, to look that up now. It's, uh, it's, it's a force of habit and you... you uh i hope you you have understanding for that uh mythology band uh, da, 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 da. Oh, okay that's why Um, uh, behemoth is is something that's gigantic and uh, just confused that um, there there are actually things that were uh, are called behemoths um, like the the heavy Gustav um, from Second World War is called a behemoth uh, the Magino line is called a behemoth um, but uh, this were dreadnoughts sorry for that. to risk losing them in a battle so they kept them in port except for one time when they had a big fight and a bunch of them got damaged so they didn't try that again the uk started conscripting men to the army so they had plenty of reserves which is just as well because the western front was about to get brutal the longest and one of the bloodiest battles of the war started when the germans launched an attack around the french city of verdun the french defended it desperately leading to hundreds of thousands of casualties under pressure the french called on its allies to do something to draw the germans attention away so the british started their own long and brutal yeah battle of the somme that's the one um i was um mentioning earlier um that i forgot the name of uh, but verdun is um uh if I remember correctly, Verdun was at that point, or is still, 
more or less fortified like from from the middle ages still um and and not only middle ages but um you know it, it was in some kind of fortified so it was um, more or less easier to defend it because you had an advantage uh, advantageous um, position it was on a hill um if i don't confuse anything now and um once again you had droves of of british and french soldiers um just storming up the walls storming up the hill uh, and getting gunned down by by um, the germans and this battle actually went on for weeks if not months the french called on its allies to do something to draw the germans attention away so the british started their own long and brutal fight the battle of the somme with 60,000 british casualties on just the first day it was also here that the British first used one crazy brand new piece of sci-fi technology. The, the Russians had been getting pushed back further and further into their own territory. But we we never forget that tanks in in World War One were like clunky uh, cans with not even re wheels, but uh, some kind of of uh, uh, chain thingies um, and. They were firstly only a few of them, um, even in battle. They were um, extremely um, fast breaking. So um, you, you, have, you have a, bu a bump in, in the road, tank can't make it. Um, that's why some of those uh, tanks actually had these um, straw um, these these giant straw things uh, strapped to them because um, if there were a bigger um, uh, uh, bulge, especially if they were about to 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 drive over um, trenches and and stuff, um, they they needed a, a makeshift bridge to to pass that, and even then they broke down uh, more often than not. Um, so um, it was just to to scare the enemy uh, more than it was to to actually fight with it of course they had their advantages because they were um, heavy armored and they had uh, guns on them and uh, you could shoot at the enemy while being kind of safe from their shootings but at the moment uh, such a tank breaks down and and uh, the uh, advance comes from the enemy you're you're more or less sitting ducks um i'm just guns uh, uh, not not speaking german here um fast checking uh yeah there's a fort at verdun which is uh might be what I meant. Uh, yeah, from February to December 1916, the Battle of Verdun, which is almost a years, and um, yeah, the fortress Verdun. Um, which, okay, it was it was the other way around. The uh, French and British were the ones holding it the uh, Germans were the ones attacking Verdun. If I understand that correctly. Yeah, okay, the Germans were attacking. Sorry for that. Let's continue. Like I said, it's, it's uh, World War II is, I can tell you exactly who attacked uh, whom uh, and where mostly um but world war one it's it's not that teached and and look at that thing it's would you want to drive with that thing while at war i mean today okay but while at war that thing is it more protection or is it more more a danger for you sci-fi technology the Russians had been getting pushed back further and further into their own territory, but in response to the French call for help, they began a huge offensive, and did really well until they ran out of supplies and got stuck. Seeing how well the Russians had been doing, Romania decided now would be a great time to jump in and win the war, and then they got pounded. 
The Greeks were fighting amongst themselves about whether to join the war or not. The king liked the Central Powers, while the Prime Minister wanted to join the Allies. After a brief national schism, during which the country split into two, the king finally abdicated and the country reunited. With Allied help, they began a new offensive. Which is also something um, we don't learn at school. Um, in, in school, when talking about World War One, we mostly um, concentrate on uh, Central Europe, um, on the trench warfare and um, on the um, Eastern Front, but not so much on the um, Southern Fronts like in Balkans or in Italy. That's why my knowledge there is even thinner than my knowledge uh, about the rest of things. Like I did not even know who attacked whom in Verdun. I always thought it was the Germans holding Verdun and the uh, Entente um, attacking. I always say Entente. It's, it's the Entente, but he says allies, so let's say allies. Um, the allies um, were holding Verdun, not the Germans. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm deeply embarrassed that I get, got that wrong. I'm so sorry. Finally abdicated and the country reunited. With Allied help, they began a new offensive. In the Middle East, Russia was pushing into Ottoman territory from the north. The British had also made a landing in Mesopotamia to protect Persia's oil fields. And they had also sent a small army up the Tigris River to try to take Baghdad. But the army got sieged in the town of Kut along the way and eventually surrendered. A new offensive was launched from the south with all-out desert warfare. The offensive was aided by one famous British officer, better known as Lawrence of Arabia, who helped lead the Arab tribes in a revolt that wreaked havoc on the Ottoman supply line. By the time 1917 rolled around, everyone was exhausted. There were mutinies in the French army. Mutiny! That's the word I was looking for earlier. Wait. Did I, did, didn't I use the word mutiny? Now I'm confused. By the time 1917 rolled around, everyone was exhausted. There were mutinies in the French army, the German populace was starving, and the war had drained all of Russia's supplies. There was no clear winner, and it was still anyone's war. The only question now was, who was going to break first? And the answer was Russia. Tired of not eating, and mad that a crazy magic homeless guy was calling some of the shots, there was an uprising in Petrograd, complete with riots and strikes. The but um, Rasputin was already dead at that point point if i remember correctly he was like killed four times i think because he was still alive somehow after being i um i don't know exactly but i uh the story i heard was he was first poisoned then he was shot then he was thrown into the river and then shot again like like something like that like killed four times still alive uh phew. What do we do? Um, but I think uh, Rasputin was already dead. But I can again be wrong. Uh, 1916. Okay, he died at that point, more or less. But before the Russian arm, uh, Russians uh, pulled off out of the wall, he was he was already dead. Crazy magic homeless guy was calling some of the shots. There was an uprising in Petrograd, complete with riots and strikes. The it riots turned Peter's into a full-scale revolution, and a new government overthrew the Tsar. Then a few months later, the Bolsheviks overthrew the new government. Yeah, that's something that everyone um, usually gets wrong. Um, the Lenin and uh, the communists um, did not um overthrow the czar um neither did rasputin because he was already dead at that point um don't trust anything you see in in uh, anastasia movie uh and anastasia was uh, killed uh, it is uh, proven today uh, due to dna analysis um but yeah um Lenin did overthrow the um, the uh, whites, I think they were called, um, that came after the Tsar, who were the ones who overthrew the Tsar. And um, they um, actually were still fighting um, with them 
which is one of the reasons why the um, family of the Tsar was uh, killed when and where they uh, were killed. Um, because they were held captive in, in uh, outside of, of uh, some small village in some uh, uh, kind of um, old building or something like far away from, from any civilization. Um, because I think they were on their way to be tried. But I... Once again, uh, my knowledge is not that clear on that. But um, if I remember correctly, they were on their way um, somewhere and they were captive. I don't know if they were kept by the whites or by the Bolsheviks. Um, but the respective other group was approaching and um, so they decided to kill them. That, it's what I remember. Um, I can be wrong entirely here, um, but that's um, how I remember it. And a new government overthrew the Tsar. Then a few months later, the Bolsheviks overthrew the new government, and they pulled Russia out of the war. This was great news for Germany, who now only had to focus on the Western Front. But there was still one problem. The pesky United States of America was looking increasingly like it was going to join the war. America had been selling supplies to the Allies throughout the war and was getting super rich off the back of it, meaning it was in fantastic shape and was dangerous to the Germans. So Germany sent a telegram to Mexico saying, wouldn't it be crazy cool if you guys attacked America? But the Which, once again, was another gamble that um, Germany took because, once again, they're still in this situation. They still want to break out um, and want to make anything happen. And what the, the least they wanted was another enemy. And um, their thought process there was if Mexico would um, like when when Texas um, joined the United States, there was a war with Mexico because Mexico uh, was not keen on that, which is uh, the war that actually not only made Texas a part of um, the US or at least the uh, the um, would be become part of the US, but it also also gained a lot of territory until uh, with uh, New Mexico and California and, and stuff, which previously belonged to uh, Mexico, and um, the the American Mexican War um, was still at least the Germans hoped that it was still seen as some kind of. Um, some kind of thing that the Mexicans would not be over with. And um, so they they thought, okay, let's convince the Mexicans to declare war on the US to regain those lost territories, um, which they lost in the American uh, Texan War, um, American uh, Mexican War, which was a hundred years or something like that before 50 years 50 to 100 years i don't know when that was uh, american history is is uh, also not that well taught in uh, germany um uh where was i yeah um they thought that the the mexicans would attack um, the us so the us would be preoccupied with uh, the Mexicans dealing with them and not join the war in Europe, um, which would be great for Germany in terms of not having another enemy and more troops to fight, um, which on long term wouldn't help though, because they still were in these um, stalemates and just waiting for anything to happen and something not happening is not something happening. Um, yeah, and uh, the Schliemann Schliemann Telegraph was it was it called Schliemann Telegraph um, was intercepted by the uh, British, which uh, he will tell now, and um, which was lastly the the reason why the U.S. joined against um, uh, joined in the war and fought against Germany. Um, which 
if you want to say so the the whole affair was pretty much an own goal for the germans there and another gamble that uh did not um end well um the only gamble as i said that end well was the one with um lenin because the germans were the ones who um f took found lenin in in switzerland uh, i guess he was at that point and convinced him uh, sent him on a train and convinced him overthrow the government and then pull russia out of the war which lenin then did so germany sent a telegram to mexico saying wouldn't it be crazy cool if you guys attacked america but the british intercepted the message showed it to the americans and that was the final straw american troops began shipping out to europe this was terrible news for germany and they knew their only hope now was to force france and the uk to surrender before the fresh american troops arrived it was now or never so they started one final attack they converged their troops and hit hard at the somme and pushed the allies back they hit a second time for the north then again and again with each hit the germans were spending more and more resources while the allies were getting better and better at repelling their attacks by the fifth punch the allies held the line and even pushed back with American troops now arriving in larger numbers, the Allies launched a counterattack, and that was it. The Central Powers were being pushed back on all fronts. Bulgaria collapsed first, followed by the Ottoman Empire, then Austria-Hungary, and finally on November 11th, 1918, at 11 o'clock, Germany surrendered. At the peace... Which is not true. Um, the, um, the armistice took effect on the 11th day on the 11th hour of the 11th month uh, 11th month 11th day 11th hour and um but the uh, armistice was uh, germany um, declared the the armistice uh, way before and it was only an armistice the uh, war itself officially um continued until um, 1919 when the uh, actual Treaty of Versailles um, was signed with the unconditional surrender of Germany and declaring Germany as the um, aggressor, which uh, is in, in German we call it Kriegsschuld, um, war guilt, and um, that was put, was put on Germany, which is heavily debated today. Uh, and even at that point, like, um, the uh the american president uh was it the american someone uh american president british uh prime minister someone walked out of the conference and said okay we just delayed um a, the war for 20 years or something um because even the uh, victors felt at some points that they were going too hard with especially with germany um it was not very much better for austria or for um, the ottoman empire treaty germany was forced to reduce its military accept war guilt and pay the bill for the war after indescribable suffering and millions dead the world learned its lesson and never had such an awful war again for about 20 years yeah uh okay uh it's time for food now okay um uh, you, will, you will get some um yeah um as we just saw uh what was it 20 million 70 million dead 20 million wound, uh, wounded um this is a number um you you, you can't imagine like um germany today has 83 million people so imagine half of that almost being either wounded or dead or let's say a quarter of that being dead almost um just just what what a what a huge loss of life that is what what a huge waste it was um in the end um because as i said earlier um the the allies did suffer um even more 
um, than than the Germans. In in total, I guess the Germans were on second place when it comes to to casualties in the war after Russia, because Russia is always um, number one because they just have the manpower. Um, but if you combine um, the losses of the Entente with the losses of the um, of the of the um, central powers, then the picture is is changing, and the um, the Allies did suffer way more. Like um, again in, in in Second World War, um, where the uh, where the Allies alone through Russia suffered more because Russia lost what 25 million alone I don't know I I, I don't have the numbers in, in my head but um, they lost the most lives even more than the Germans did and um, it, it's just unimaginable um, and it uh, I'm, I'm very very afraid of um, actually thinking about uh, what what if such such kind of war would break out today even when fought without nuclear weapons um, surely there would be even more dead because on one hand there are just more people um, on, on the planet we are over 7 billion which is uh, like triple um, what uh, of what there uh, there were at the beginning of the century and i don't know if triple if double about but it's it's a lot 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 more than then um and i'm pretty sure war today would be very much um, more devastating and when when you just look back to it and see that the whole thing more or less just started because some people in a multicultural empire wanted to be um independent like like imagine the um the american uh revolution the american um independence wars would would have been the the starting point for a world war with with this um casualties um it's it's just unimaginable and and the same goes for 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 this is it's just one guy more or less it's very very oversimplified but one guy got killed and and suddenly um for this one guy 70 million more would die i i don't know that's 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 just crazy um but anyway uh we're at the end of uh the video um if you liked it uh, please like and subscribe uh, you find the link to the original videos in the description um let me know what you think. Uh, let me know if I talk too much, if I talk too little, if I should only um, comment on things I know, uh, because not knowing who was defending Verdun and who was attacking, and um, I'm sure I, I did other stuff wrong in this video as well. Um, if you like it, tell me. If you don't like it, tell me. Um, anyway, I hope um, to see you around with uh, the next video. And um, say thank you for watching and goodbye.